Llama Llama, red pajama, reads a story with his mama. Mama kisses baby's hair. Mama Llama goes downstairs. Llama Llama, red pajama, feels alone without his mama. Mama Llama wants a drink. Mama's kitchen at the sink. Llama Llama, red pajama, calls out to his llama mama. Llama says she'll be up soon. Llama Llama hums a tune. I need to have Jubilee clean her books from down here. But I do like reading Llama Llama. Maybe it's just the rhymes. I haven't even flipped open my Bible. You could grab your Bible if you want. We're in John 19. I didn't even have to look this morning because I knew right where we left off. At the beginning of a new chapter. Oh. Ah. I gotta change my mindset. I've been studying Song of Solomon all morning and I'm super excited for this Sunday. Man, that book is amazing. Like, I can see now why Charles Spurgeon and D.L. Moody and those guys, it was their favorite book of the Bible. And it's just been fun digging and digging and digging. And now I'm trying to like weed through things and figure out how to narrow it down to cover it on one Sunday night. It's gonna be hard, but it's gonna be good. And so many songs, so many wonderful songs are just coming alive, like songs that I've always liked. And then, I don't know, did the artist realize? I'm assuming they knew that like, it's the Song of Solomon that makes these worship songs come alive and have all new meaning. So very cool. But speaking of the book of love, Song of Solomon, now we're going to see uh, about God's love because Jesus is now being taken to the cross. So let us start John 19 verse 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. One verse. One verse and it encompasses so much. Um, you see, uh, we learn in Isaiah that he'd be taken as a lamb to the slaughter. He would open not his mouth. Now that's key and critical because see the the Romans or the Jews at least I don't know about the Romans but the Jews had this idea of 40 lashings minus one and what it was was they were allowed to beat someone 40 times that was what was allowed oh my wife is on and that was what was allowed um, by the law and they would do minus one because if they miscounted, they'd rather miscount and go over 39 and hit 40 rather than go over 40 and hit 41. Because that's how the Jews rolled. They, they didn't want to be missing stuff. And so, uh, 40 lashings. Well, the way it would work is they would take you and they would uh, hold you. they chain you to a post. And then they would whip you with what's called the flagellum. Now, this flagellum was not just a, a, an everyday whipping type of thing. It was brutal. It was, you know, a wooden handle with long leather straps. Inside of those leather straps would be pieces of glass, pieces of metal, and pieces of bone. And all of these things would dangle and jingle, you know, as you held this thing. And when they whipped you, many of these things would not just slice you open, but they would grab onto your flesh like a fishing hook, like a barb. And if anyone has ever been poked with a fishing hook before, you understand the concept of a barb. The barb is meant so that when the hook goes in, it doesn't come out, right? That's the idea with uh, catch and release fishing. You, you use a barbless hook because that hook can slide in to the flesh and then slide back out. But a barb hook, when you try and pull it out, the barb is a point going the other direction. So you can't pull it out with essentially ripping things open, which makes releasing a fish very difficult if you're not trying to hurt the fish. Well, these pieces of metal, glass, bone in the flagellum, they would grab into the flesh as you were whipped with this tool. And they would typically get confessions out of people. They would whip, but they would expect that person to confess and, and scream and cry for mercy. And once the soldiers got all the information they were looking for, or they seemed that the person was broken, you know, okay, they're asking for mercy. They're asking for forgiveness. They're asking for, for to be let easy on. 
they would begin to, to pull back. They would lay off. You know, they got the point across, really. How many times do you need a bunch of shards of metal, glass, and bone to be attached to your skin and pieces of your body ripped off of you? How many of those hits does it take before you're begging for mercy? Before you'll tell them anything? But Isaiah tells us he kept his mouth silent. He did not open it. He went and he took the entire scourging without a word because he had nothing to confess. He had nothing to ask for forgiveness for. He had no need to ask for mercy. You see, that's the thing with Jesus, was that he became sin who knew no sin, right? He had nothing to confess. He had nothing to admit to. And yet he also knew that the cup would not pass from him that he was to receive our punishment. And the cross was the ultimate place of the punishment, but it's good to remember that it's not just his blood was shed, but that his body was broken. Isaiah tells us that he was marred to the point where he was not recognizable as a man. You see, the passion of the Christ was probably, probably the most brutal uh, rendition of the beating and crucifixion of Jesus that we can find in Hollywood. And yet, the passion of the Christ does not go far enough. You know, the Bible talks about his beard getting plucked out. It just talks about just the, the way they beat him. There's a dove landing in my yard. That's kind of cool. Um, being beaten so much, again, that his face would have been swollen and cut and torn that they couldn't recognize who he was as a human at this point. And so they take him, and again, they, they beat him, and so his body was broken for us. That's part of the idea. This is my body broken for you. It's not just that his blood was shed. It is the blood that has the cleansing power, but it's just the idea that he took this whole punishment upon himself. And so for this to be one verse in John's Gospel, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. There's just so much more in there that we needed to understand and we needed to grasp. And then verse 2. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. And so they're mocking him now. That's the whole thing was he was being tried because the Jews said that he wanted to be king. You see, the Jews needed to bring something before the Romans that the Romans would actually take seriously and perhaps uh, initiate and institute some judgment and justice on. And so just breaking a few religious rules, the Romans wouldn't have really done anything about that. But when they say, well, this guy wants to be king, well, then there's a problem because only Rome gets to pick the king and only Caesar is king. In fact, we see the Jews say, we have no king but Caesar. And so that's the idea is that these Roman soldiers are now mocking him, putting a purple, which is the color of royalty, a purple robe upon him. And they put the crown of thorns on his head. And I have still yet to snag some of those plants when I'm in Israel, but you can find these trees that grow these branches with some hefty thorns on them. These are big thorns. And uh, the one place I knew where I could find one of those trees, it looked like everyone broke off all the branches and they were way too high last time I was there. I tried to snag them uh, by the Jesus boat, um, Nof Kinofar up on the north side of the Galilee. They have a bunch of trees and they're all labeled. And anyway, so now you know where to get it though if you're ever in Israel. Um, so they put the crown of thorns on his head. They put the purple robe. They mock him. Uh, you can go today uh, down below the city and you can get to the bottom floor of what was the Antonia Fortress. This is where Jesus was, the Praetorium, the Antonia Fortress on the north side of the Temple Mount. And there on the floor, you can even find a board game. And what history and tradition tells us is this board game was used and they would actually beat up and pick on and abuse their prisoners 
uh, as a live part of the board game. They play the game, they abuse the prisoner. And so some of what we're reading of here seems to align with that. And so you can actually go underground and see this very board game still carved in the floor of the rocks that make up the floor of the Antonio Fortress. Now, verse four, Pilate then went out again and said to them, behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. So Pilate's once again saying, hey, I, I punished him. And I think Pilate probably even endorsed a very thorough scourging with the hope that this would suit the religious leaders, that they would accept that in place of crucifixion. But he says, I find no uh, fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Then the Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard this saying, he was the more afraid. And he went into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? So Pilate's bringing him inside again because he thought maybe, maybe the beating was enough. Maybe this will make them have some peace and they'll calm down because he's trying to stop the riot. Remember, at the end of this all, riots later on or what ended up getting Pilate kicked out and almost executed because of his inability to stop the Jews from rioting. So he's trying to stop a riot. He's bringing Jesus back inside. He's like, listen, man, who are you? Because these guys obviously are not letting up. Where are you from? Why won't you tell me anything? Jesus, don't you realize that I have the power to either crucify you, by you or let you go? And Jesus answers in verse 11, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. You know, it's a good idea to remember this, the words of Jesus, it actually correlates perfectly with Romans 13 and 1 Peter and Titus and even in Ecclesiastes, where it talks about government being ordained by God. Pilate says, I have the power to do this. Don't you realize? And Jesus says, no, no, no. See, you only have the power that God enabled you to have. Maybe this would just be an interesting closing thought for us. But once again, the things that we are experiencing right now during the COVID lockdown period, uh, which is not good in Washington, but not nearly as bad as our friends in, in California and in other places, once again, God ordains leadership. The Bible says it, that power is put in place by God. And we wonder, well, I mean, this stuff's all bad. And, and, and what, how do we do, what do we do about it? Now, just because God ordains it doesn't mean necessarily it's a good thing in the sense that what they're doing is right. But maybe what good God will bring out of it all wouldn't have happened any other way. I've seen many people get more serious about their faith during this lockdown period because all of a sudden they weren't able just to be casual about it. It was either you're in or you're out. Pilate had the power to crucify Jesus. Now, obviously, Jesus getting crucified isn't a good thing at face value, and yet without it, there'd be no atonement for sin. Hitler was a horrible man and did horrible things, and yet, after World War II, all the atrocities, the horrific things done by the Nazis, it opened the door for the Jews to get back their homeland of Israel. And I don't believe that would have happened had there not been such a worldwide terrible event that opened up the world's eyes to the need for the Jews to go back to their homeland. Nothing like that has ever been seen in history. So yet again, God allows people into power what they do may be evil, and yet God's perfect plan gets done because of what those people are doing. And so Pilate here thinks he has power, and Jesus says, no, Pilate, you've only got the power that my Father has given you, and what's going to be done is going to be done. So we'll continue tomorrow 
little bit more as we dive into the crucifixion of our Lord. God bless you guys. Share this with a friend. And uh, yeah, hold fast and stay strong. I'll see you guys again soon.